You're listening to the Creative Field Recording Podcast, where we learn about capturing audio beyond the studio and sharing sound with others. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Paul Verostek and I am your host for the Creative Field Recording Podcast. This is episode two of the podcast, Common Mistakes and How to Fix Them, Specific Field Recording Tips. Today we'll be talking about field recording technique, errors made by both newbies and pros, and how to solve them. A note, like every episode, this is a reading of the weekly blog post on creativefieldrecording.com, published May 15th, 2019. I want to thank everyone for their support for the first episode. When I began, I wasn't really sure what the response would be. I really appreciate the retweets, the mentions, the likes on Facebook, and the support people sent via email. I really appreciate it. The first episode began a series exploring common field recording mastering and sound library curation mistakes. This series shares common yet easily overlooked stumbling blocks for beginners and sound pros alike and how to fix them. Today's episode takes another look at field recording foibles, common errors that plague even the veteran sound artists in the crowd. Let's learn more. Specific mistakes. The previous episode shared general field recording mistakes. Number one, mixing dominant subjects. Number two, recording copyrighted audio. Number three, working with others. Number four, skipping slating. Number five, fix it in post. And number six, forgetting to listen. Those mistakes, while simple, appear in many sound libraries and field recordings I've heard while previewing, curating, doing Q&A, and ingesting sound effects for others. They were the broad strokes, missteps common to those new to capturing sound beyond the studio. They are common because aspiring field recorders may not have experience to know three important things. That they are actually errors in the first place, how to spot the errors, and that the mistakes actually have a significant effect on field recordings. Those mistakes were global ones that have the ability to ruin every field recording session. Today's episode takes a different approach. The errors today are specific. They won't be encountered every time you punch in. Instead, they focus on missteps that occur in particular places with certain subjects and when using specialized technique. Because they are so specific, there are mistakes even more advanced field recorders can overlook regularly. I've organized them into broad categories. Each has a few short mistakes and shares ideas on how to fix problems. The categories are incidental sounds, performances, technique, gear management, and slating. Incidental sounds. Many exceptional sound effects are ruined by a problem called overlap. We learned a bit about this in the last episode, discovering the problems when two dominant subjects are mixed. That happens when two desirable sounds happen at the same time. It also occurs when undesirable sounds overlap field recordings too. Imagine hearing a recording of distant rolling thunder, but when you listen closely, you hear a watch ticking. Perhaps the recordist forgot to remove it. Maybe they assumed the microphone couldn't pick it up. Whichever the case, these sounds have the ability to make an entire recording worthless. You wouldn't think so. After all, they're minute. They're deceptively damaging just the same. The last episode touched on this a bit. Non-pros shift their feet or clear their throat, not knowing how loud these small sounds are. This problem isn't limited to newbies, though. Even experienced pros forget these small sounds dangerously easily. That's why the problem occurs from incidental sounds. They're often overlooked. This is such a standard problem that you'll encounter it in every shoot. Here are common examples I've heard. Voices. Stepped away from the mic, whispering to a friend about the amazing sounds you're hearing? Don't assume the microphones won't hear it. Save the comments for later, even if you're sure you are distant. Movement. This ranges from foot scuffs, clothing rustles, or simple posture shifts. 
Solve this by putting a sound blanket under your position and equipment. Breathing. Even soft breathing can be perceived in quiet ambiences. Be aware of your breath. Had to run back to your equipment or just finished a strenuous performance? Wait until your breathing dies down. Better yet, move three meters away from your microphone. Debris. Even a light breeze can kick up dried leaves or trash and contribute unwanted rattling or rustling. Crush the leaves and stow the trash to keep recordings clean. Clocks, watches, fridges, light buzz, and compressor hum. These are so quiet it's easy to forget about them. They make it into field recordings just the same. Shut them off or pad them with sound blankets. Other examples, tent fabric flapping in the wind, jingling car keys while driving, and train window panes rattling. Don't forget to walk away from your car after you've driven to the perfect location. Your microphone may pick up metal pings as the car cools down. Buffeting wind. A prop passing too quickly or closely to a microphone can cause a swell of air. This appears on microphones as a subtle but problematic thump. This is common when recording shutting doors or when throwing objects. The best solution is to move the microphone back or out of the path of the swell of air. Mobile phones. I've heard endless field recordings ruined by a cell phone ringing while performing a take. Even the pros get tripped up by this one. There's a risk even when phones are set to silent mode. A mobile phone can generate interference unheard by the human ear that is picked up on disk as a whining intermittent chatter. Set cell phones on flight mode or, better yet, turn them off completely. Field recordings are delicate. Even the smallest incidental sound can ruin a recordist's hard work. They're infuriating to fix at best or impossible to deal with at worst. Take a moment to listen to your environment and adjust so field recordings remain pure. Performances. Repetitive performances. Field recordings are generally split into two categories, passive and active sessions. In passive sessions, the recordist doesn't interact with the subject at all and doesn't control the sound directly. An example would be recording whipping freeway traffic. In contrast, the recordist directly affects the sound in active sessions. This could be metal crash recordings, for instance. The recordist has a great deal of influence on both types, despite what you might assume from the names. This is something even master field recordists seem to overlook. It's common to hear sound libraries with dozens of clips that sound virtually identical. Some examples. Ten door sounds opening and shutting at the same speed, from the same direction, distance, and with the same power. Dropping ammunition, the same distance and strength for every take. A forest recording that runs for 10 minutes with little change. Five three minute rain recordings of the same intensity onto similar surfaces. Of course, if two sounds are nearly the same, why bother having both? The greater issue is that repetitive performances are a lost opportunity. The time spent capturing a clip the same as the last is better spent injecting a new perspective, performance, or position instead. Why does this happen? I think it's an understandable mistake for a few reasons. First, the complexity and even excitement of field recording makes it difficult to record with intentionality. It's not easy to be uber creative when you're juggling talent or managing 20 tracks of audio. What's more, at times field recordists tend to view themselves as passive collectors of audio rather than a force that affects the nature of sound around them. What helps is to be creative beforehand, prep a shot list, and work from it later in the field. Avoid performing a door closed the same over and over. Shift your position around a waterfall every few minutes. Alter your recordings to create more valuable effects in the same amount of time. In field recording, time is just as much a resource as battery life and memory card storage. Maximize it. Truncated performances. Many show-stopping sound effects are the big ones. Gunshots, booming thunder, supercars, pounding ocean waves, and the cacophony of a jungle. There's a lot of beauty in softer sounds too, such as a gentle drizzle, library murmurs, and others. These quiet sounds are fragile. It's more difficult to record them because the slightest incidental sound that would be hidden by louder sounds is painfully apparent when recording gentle ones. Many of these sounds are especially delicate at two spots. 
when they begin and when they end. These are two areas where people tend to be listening more keenly. Once a sound has become established, listeners are more forgiving or distracted and the impact is diminished. So problem sounds in the head or tail of a sound have a greater impact. They make those areas of field recording useless, essentially truncating a sound. Examples include car passes. It's easy to forget. There's a lot of value, not just in the loud Doppler pass by, but also in the 15 seconds before or after. The slightest footstep can ruin the valuable head and tail of the pass by. Resonant sounds, a metal drop or bell ringing. While the sound may seem complete during the initial crash, cool characteristic shutters or rocking only reveal themselves after the impact has occurred. Some of the most valuable sounds are the subtle ones. Why? They can't be faked. It's relatively easy to edit a quiet crowd into a larger one. Doing the reverse is nearly impossible. Recreating a car driving into the distance or subtle metal wobbling is challenging. The solution? Let field recordings breathe. Wait five seconds after beginning recording. Let five seconds pass after the sound before moving, speaking, or stopping the take. This is especially important to emphasize to talent. Imagine a collector operating a vintage pump. They may not know that it is important to let sounds ring out and instead perform one take directly after another. Explain the concept beforehand. During the takes, hold up a finger count so they can see how long they should wait. This helps preserve the valuable head and tail of field recordings. Technique, mono ambiences. This is a quick tip for beginners. I sometimes see atmospheres recorded in mono or dual mono. Always record ambiences in stereo. Why? Since it is a single channel, mono environmental field recordings lack the ability to convey depth, space, and breadth. All three are vital to create a sense of immersion for ambient field recording. Record in stereo instead. Image shift. This field recording problems happens when the sound appears to momentarily wobble or ripple. Known as image shift, it happens when the stereo image warps or moves. It typically happens in two ways. A handheld microphone is moved, pointing in a new direction for a short period of time. This can happen from arm fatigue or unsteady hands during long takes. The best solution is to use a microphone stand instead of a handhold grip. Something moves in front of a microphone, altering the depth and breadth of the stereo image momentarily. Solve this by creating a bubble around your microphone. That ensures there is an uninterrupted space surrounding your microphone at all times. Improper levels. You hear a siren approaching. You assemble your gear frantically, hoping to set it up before it arrives. You're not sure how loud it will be. What levels should you set? It's often difficult to know. Beginners may not know how loud subjects will be or how much sound pressure level, or SPL, their gear will tolerate. Of course, it's never good to allow the sound to peak or pass zero dBFS. This causes distortion and damages the sound. So this must be avoided at all times. Most field recordists are aware of this. What is not as apparent is how sounds can suddenly change and peak without warning. This is why it is good to leave 5 to 10 dB of headroom. This creates a type of buffer that ensures sudden loud sounds won't become damaged. Another important point, not all sounds should be recorded as loud as possible. Winds recorded at 0 dB will be a torrent of noise. Even sweet morning birds recorded at the highest possible levels will sound overwhelming and unpleasant. Avoid recording everything as loud as possible. Instead, record levels relative to each other. A gunshot should be very loud, rush hour traffic less than that, pouring rain quieter still, followed by winds and empty rooms at even softer levels. There are a number of approaches to setting recording levels, depending on who will hear the sounds. Just starting field recording? Use these tips. Avoid recording at zero dB. Leave five to 10 dB of headroom and record subjects proportionally. Those guidelines will help record the vast majority of sounds well. Gear management. Forgetting wind protection. Wind is the greatest threat to field recording. It is the chance to invade almost any location. It's difficult to avoid when it appears. 
It destroys all frequencies of sound. I've heard enough blown-out field recordings to realize that the threat of wind is misunderstood. In the vast majority of cases, recording outside demands wind protection. What's the best way to do this? Options include using foam windscreens, softy, smoothie wind jammers, fuzzy wind jammers, wind busters or windscreens, and windshield blimps. Don't have pro wind protection? Use the environment, cardboard, or fabric to make impromptu blinds to shelter the microphones from gusts and breezes. Avoiding wind should be your first task when beginning capturing sounds in the wild. Use a microphone stand. Handheld microphone grips allow run-and-gun field recordists to move quickly to capture sound effects. There's a drawback many of these gorilla recordists forget. A handheld grip can damage field recordings as they are captured. How? Well, pointing a handheld grip is a simple task for a few seconds. It's not easy to keep your arms steady after half a minute or while tracking a subject's movement. The result? The stereo image may shift. The microphone wobbles in the mount, adding rattles to the sound. Shifting palms and fingers contribute handling noise to the recording. These are difficult to fix afterwards. If possible, mount the microphone on a stand instead. If a handheld grip is required, ensure the microphone mount is secure. Check the lyre or elastics to keep wobbling to a minimum. Reckless equipment arrangement. Take the time to ensure your equipment is secured before punching in and beginning performing. Watch out for these common errors. Wind whistling through cabling. Use zip ties or tape to secure loose cables. Stand rattles. Use sandbags to keep microphone stands on their feet. Inflated sampling rates. Ever experience dragging overpacked suitcases through airport check-in to immigration line to security check and beyond? As you pull your rollerboards down yet another endless airport corridor, you may wish you packed lighter. It's a sensation similar to using field recordings captured with inflated sampling rates. Using sounds recorded at 192 kilohertz demands intense processing power to audition, convert, and process the clips. Add a dozen to a session and your machine will slow to a crawl. In theory, field recordings captured at advanced sampling rates will gather higher quality sound. The reality is not so simple. We typically hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. A sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz is enough to gather sound within that range. What's more, the majority of microphones cannot detect or capture sound beyond 20,000 hertz anyway. The result? Files recorded at sampling rates beyond 44.1 kilohertz collect data that is rarely used or even perceived. Arguments exist that claim recording at higher sampling rates improves the sound even when we cannot directly hear the result. It's true there's little harm in recording at 48 kilohertz. The standard for sound effects library recording is 96 kilohertz. Beyond that, be judicious when choosing to record at 192 kilohertz. 192 kilohertz is best used when recording sound clips that are expected to be processed. The extra samples allow clips to be pitched with smoother results, for example. Recording metal drops, capturing ice shattering, cannon blasts, go for 192 kilohertz. Out recording ambiences of a flowing river, stick to 96 kilohertz instead. It's tempting to record with the highest fidelity our field recorders allow. Consider carefully when choosing the loftiest sampling rates. It takes little effort to select the higher sampling rates in the field. And yes, hard drive space is cheap. However, field recording files at higher sampling rates are larger than they have to be. They require more computing power to process. 192 kilohertz files are twice as large as they need to be. This means, for instance, that web shops will pay more in bandwidth fees every time they are uploaded, shared, or stored. Many shop owners I've worked with ask higher sampling rates be downsampled for their customers before ingesting onto their sites. Be mindful about sampling rates. Choose the best resolution for the subjects you pursue. Slating. Forgetting sync slates. The previous episode examined what happens when field recorders forget to ID or slate the recordings. There's a more specific type of slating that is also overlooked. Sync slating. Imagine recording a protest crowd. You've arranged four portable recorders around the town square. However, when you return to the edit suite later, it's difficult to align them. 
each recording is a different length. Getting them in sync is a maddening process of dragging files just a few milliseconds left, then right, then left again. Sync slating solves this problem. It is used to create a reference point. You've probably seen something similar on film sets when crew snaps a clapperboard in front of the camera. This ensures the audio will be in sync with the camera. When field recording, a single sync slate is created for all microphones and recorders at the same time. Sometimes this is done with a clapperboard. That's often not loud enough though, since multiple microphones are usually far apart. So loud, short, and sharp tones from air horns or bull horns do the trick. This creates a distinctive sound and waveform. Mastering techs use this in the edit suite later to ensure all microphones and recorders are presented in tandem. Have a long track? You may discover that field recordings begun and ended at the same time are actually different lengths. This may be only fractions of a second. However, even a small difference can affect the channels when they are used together. This technical issue is called drift. Minimize this by making a sync slate at the end of the long recording as well as the beginning. This will provide valuable clues to know if a field recording has drifted and how serious the change is. You're listening to Post Rain Rainforest Drizzle. It was recorded on Vancouver Island in Pacific Rim National Park. It was recorded with a Neumann RSM 190 microphone tracked to a Fostex FR2 recorder. It was just a slight distance in from the shore so you can hear a subtle roar of the ocean. The MP3 file doesn't give the highest resolution so you can download the sound from the website if you want to get a better listen to the recording. It was an interesting recording because not only was it an amazing place to record, but the FR2, even though it was an old recorder and it's made of plastic, so it's a little bit, feels a little bit junky, but I really like the sound of it. It sort of conveyed a soft, smooth sound to the recording. That's it for this time. Send your emails to paul at creativefieldrecording.com. Follow the blog on Twitter at, at Paul Verostic, and join Creative Field Recording on Facebook at fb.me forward slash creative field recording. I've now added the podcast to iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube, as well as SoundCloud. Find the links to each of these on the right sidebar of creativefieldrecording.com. Thanks for listening.